I am delighted to introduce our first speaker uh, who uh, has written a book. It's, to my knowledge, the first book that is from one of you all, somebody in this space. Uh, this is Christine Bader, graduate of, of Amherst. We won't hold that against her, the, next to Williams over here. Uh, and also uh, Yale uh, MBA, worked at BP. Bios and all are in your, your, your books as you go through that. But really a terrific book about jobs that you all have had, BP, right? Um, and what that means and the challenges, the issues. Uh, the book is good reading, uh, but in the manifesto, which is in the epilogue here, um, 10 steps for, for jobs that we all have. And, and I'll, I'll just stop with, uh, you know, we won't um, hit these all, but just a few things that'll help to introduce. First is what is good for society is good for any company. Second, responsible business. Responsible business should be redundant, not an oxymoron. Evangelizing to my colleagues is not helpful. Figure out how my work supports them is. And finally, if consultation and collaboration aren't both frustrating and worthwhile, then you haven't done it right. Ladies and gentlemen, Christine Bader. All right, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Um, so this morning, I'm going to share with you my story. And uh, not just because I've done some interesting things in some interesting places, but because, as Daryl said, it's your story, too. It's about the ups and downs of doing this work, of trying to make sure that our companies realize our potential to be a force for good in the world. So I joined BP in the fall of 2000 as a newly minted MBA and convinced that business was a force for good in the world. And I joined because, at the time, John Brown was leading the company. He was the CEO of BP. And he had recently become the first head of a major energy company to acknowledge the realities of climate change and urge action. This seemed to be a different kind of oil man trying to create a different kind of energy company. So I joined BP, and I actually saw those aspirations come to life. My first posting with BP was in Indonesia. And I ended up focusing on a liquefied natural gas plant that BP was building in West Papua which is the remote eastern tip of the country. Has anybody been there? Yeah, uh, it's pretty remote. <laughs> and this project was so environmentally and socially sensitive. We had to relocate 127 households to make way for this plant. We were going to have to work with the notoriously violent and corrupt Indonesian military. And this was a place that had pretty much been neglected by its national government. There was very little there in the way of social services or infrastructure. So I had full reign to bring in world-class experts to help advise us on the resettlement, on human rights, to set up community programs, to spend, spend, spend money on impact assessments, on community investment, on hiring and training community liaison officers. And remember, this was my first job out of business school, right? So I'm living this cliche of doing well and doing good, right? And all of even the most hard-nosed commercial and production guys understood that the work that I was doing was critical to success of the company. I fell in love with big oil. <laughs> it's like, this is awesome. This is how big business works. And then I moved to China, and I had a similar experience there. I was working on a BP joint venture with Sinopec, one of China's state energy companies. And we were going to be bringing in a migrant workforce of about 15,000 men into a town of about 30,000 people, which could be a little disruptive. So again, I had free reign to engage, to invest, to connect, to innovate. Amazing, I loved big oil. And then I moved back to London, uh, to BP headquarters, and I was charged with working with staff around the world who were working in similarly tricky places to see if we were sharing, if we were learning from our experiences, if we were reinventing the wheel, there was a lot of that, to try to set up a network and community and articulate the companies position on human rights. How do we think about it? How, we, how do we manage some of the challenges? So again, I was working with people around the world who, like me, were committed to trying to figure out how to get this right, to live in that sweet spot 
of the alignment between the interests of the business and the interests of society. An amazing experience. And so as I was doing that work, I was getting up to speed on the external debate over corporate responsibilities for human rights. And that was coalescing around this United Nations mandate. So I left BP to go work on that full time. And for a while, it was fascinating. I was at the epicenter of international policy making and getting to see what happens when you have these global consultations, when NGOs and campaigners and governments all get together. And that was fascinating for a while. And then the sort of bureaucracy and the abstraction started to drive me a little bit bonkers. Um, and at all these consultations that we had, I found myself gravitating back towards the company people, right? Who, like me, were thinking, OK, this is a really interesting debate, but what am I going to do differently on Monday? Because I'm going to do something on Monday. My company is going to do something, and I need help getting it right. So I was starting to feel very nostalgic uh, for my time with BP and my corporate life. And then in 2010, the Deepwater Horizon rig exploded, killing 11 men and wreaking environmental and economic havoc around the Gulf and beyond. And then this BP emerged in the aftermath of that disaster, right? And all the press and the investigations as this, this, this reckless, risk-taking, callous place. And it simply didn't resemble the BP that I, that I had loved, right? That I thought I knew so well, that I had worked for for nine years. So my first thought was, that is not my BP. They've got, that is, that is so, that is not my BP. And then my second thought was, or was it? And what, what did I, did I miss something? Should I have seen something? And then the question that I think all of us have asked ourselves doing this work, was I more marginalized than I realized? Was I actually sitting at the kitty table when real business was being conducted elsewhere? So it really started off as this personal exploration to try to reconcile these two BPs and really to try to understand what it means to do this work in one of these big, massive companies? What does it mean to do corporate responsibility or corporate citizenship? So I started talking to lots of the friends and peers I've gotten to know over the years doing this work. And then I realized that we face so many common frustrations and challenges, and that there were all these themes. And that's when I realized, OK, this story needs to be told. There's clearly a book here, because I also got really frustrated with the coverage after every corporate disaster, right? Deepwater Horizon, Rana Plaza, the financial crisis, whatever. The public narrative seemed to be, oh, great, an example of another evil company. We need more regulation, right? And like, how's that working out? So I wanted to shine a light on the people who are working deep inside these companies, trying to prevent the very disasters that ensued. And we need to understand, why do we fail and what do we need in order to succeed? So that's why I wrote the book. And let me just share with you a couple of the themes that emerged. Let's see if any of these resonate. <laughs> and Daryl touched on a couple of them. So um, the first one that emerged is that no one gets rewarded for something that doesn't happen. And a lot of the work that I did with BP and that a lot of my peers did was, as Daryl said, to de-risk. Right? So whether that's op operational risk, reputational risk, whatever, but that can be kind of hard to reward. So one of the women who I interviewed manages supply chain uh, program for a big company. And she told me how livid she was when one of her company's internal awards, which you know, are very prestigious in a big company, right, went to one of her colleagues who managed a huge safety disaster. And she was like, are you kidding me? I prevented 20 of those. But that's kind of hard to reward for. Right? And I interviewed a couple of people who were brought into their companies after crises, which, as we all know, can be a good, good silver lining kind of time to come in because people get the urgency and see the need to change right now. 
But then, if you're really good at your job, right, a couple years later, a couple CEOs later, people start looking around and looking at your headcount and your budget and going, uh, I don't know, we don't need you, right? I mean, nothing bad's happened. It's like, yeah, nothing bad has happened because I'm here doing the work that I'm doing. <laughs> so that was one clear frustration. Second theme that emerged was the importance of bearing witness. And this came up a lot because it can be so easy to sit in our corporate offices or cubicles and make these decisions that are very far removed from the impacts that our companies actually have on people and communities. So a lot of the people who I talked to talked about how important it was for them to get out into the field, either for their own sort of personal commitment and understanding, as one person told me, understanding what they're fighting for, but also arranging for senior management to visit. So Laura Rubo, who's on the International Labor Standards team at Disney, talked about arranging trips for Disney CFO to go visit some factories where their products are made in China. And they did the trip like any other trip, random selection of factories, unannounced visits. They saw some good factories, and they saw some not so good ones. Somebody else I interviewed told me how he couldn't, he couldn't arrange trips, but he brought in photos to a management meeting. He did his spreadsheet presentation, right? But then he also brought in photos, saying, here's where we're sourcing. And he said the CEO and CFO did not like what they saw so much. And they were stopping him, like stopping him in the hallway, like, hey, uh, what's, um, get me an update on that factory? And his budget went up the following year, et cetera, et cetera. So the importance of bearing witness. Third theme was the importance of listening and creating ownership. So Daryl mentioned one of the points in my manifesto there at the end, uh, which is that evangelizing is not helpful. When I first got to China, I went in there saying, OK, we are going to protect the human rights of workers and communities. Yeah, and it's, I mean, I didn't get thrown out or anything, but it just, it just kind of felt flat. And then I tried, OK, these are the standards that BP uses around the world, and we're going to use them here. I was like, that's just you know, kind of arrogant. So I finally had to shut up for a while and listen to how people talked about their work, what motivated them, what they were worried about. So finally, when I came back and said, OK, I, I understand that you guys want this to be a world-class model project. And if that's the case, these are the standards that world-class model projects use, and we're going to use them here. And they were like, oh, OK, why didn't you say so? And so one of the people um, who I interviewed talked about when he came into his company, his CEO was really excited to announce these big, bold sustainability goals, right? And so they're sitting in his office, and it's his first week there. And he says, OK, I, let's, just, let's just come up with the goals right now, and then I'm going to announce them, and then you're going to tell everybody how to go implement them. I know a couple of people are shaking their head, right? Like, and, and he was like, OK, they're going to hate me, <laughs> and it's not going to work. So give me some time to sit with the department heads understand what they're paid to do, what they're measured on, and then we can figure out how to frame how what we want to do supports theirs. And uh, Dave Stangus, who's a vice president at Campbell Soup, who many of you know, told me, gave me a, a nice quote. He said that, um, you know, those of us who have been doing this for a while, we used to think we had to evangelize. If only people could just get it, could just get sustainability and get citizenship and just see the world the way that we do, our jobs would be so much easier. And he said, we've realized that that just doesn't work anymore. We have to listen to what people are paid on and rewarded for and figure out, again, how what we want to do supports theirs. So listening and creating ownership. The final theme, which was a real punchline and, and aha for me, was incrementalism. Doing this work is incremental. And those of us who choose to work in big companies and those of us who are working on the biggest, most complex, thorniest issues at the heart of globalization, it's going to take a while. It takes a long time to move our big super tanker companies, and stuff is still going to go wrong. And I talked to friends in apparel after the Rana Plaza factory collapse who similarly know that they've been making progress on improving supply chain working conditions over the past 20 years 
but horrible things still happen. And so a lot of the people who I interviewed really had come to understand that and embrace it. And that's, for me, what really helped me reconcile my time with BP, that I know, obviously, I did not manage to transform the whole company, but I know I made a difference to those 127 families on that project in Indonesia. I know I made a difference to those 15,000 migrant workers and the other tens of thousands of people who live near them, and that the work that I did on those projects was critical to the success of the business there. That's not bad, although I know it's not good enough. So that's my story. And again, I think it's your story, too. One other theme uh, that emerged was the importance of community, right? of getting together and having a forum, you know, just as Daryl said, to, to share our challenges and our frustrations. But again, as one of the choices was up there, to also share our successes. Because our successes to the outside world can look like pretty small stuff. Hey, we just launched a new policy. We just signed on to a new initiative. But we all know how much buy-in and alignment and hard work it takes to make every one of those steps. So celebrate each other's successes today. I have um, two quotes in the, in the front of the book. And uh, one of them is from John Brown when he was leading BP around the time that I joined the company. Um, and he said, a good business should be both competitively, competitively successful and a force for good. And the second quote I have is from the poet W.H. Auden. And it's, um, there, is, there is a great deal of difference between believing something still and believing it again. So having had my heart broken by big oil, I have actually come back around to believing that business can and must be a positive force for good in the world. But I know it's not going to happen by accident. And we need the most passionate, dedicated people working to make that happen. There is nothing more important. And we need fora like this to help us get that work done. That is what counts. Thank you.